With the case for energy justice hopefully being compellingly made already for many of you listening to this, I often ask myself, as I guess any good reflexive researcher should, how can we get better uh, at doing research that has an impact at changing the world, documenting injustice, proposing policy solutions, or otherwise leading um, to changes and reforms that make the future a better place to live in rather than, than a, the first place to, to the worst place to live in. Um, and so with that in mind, we, we did embark on a review article a few years ago that tried to get at the heart of how to get, not perfect, but how to improve the way that we do research. Uh, and we've kind of focused the core of it on these things on novelty, rigor, and style, which I will come back to. But essentially what we wanted to do is kind of firstly bring attention for those who have very little experience in research methods the kind of the basic steps. Here are things most of the time that every single researcher should do in everything that they do, whether it is a perspective or an article or a book or a book chapter or a conference proceeding. So it's kind of like the basic mechanics of writing, which even us professional researchers forget. We also wanted to talk through many times when you submit research, editors or reviewers will say, what's the novelty? I can't see the novelty. Um, and this really means kind of having a new contribution to knowledge. But what does that mean? It's very vague. So in this kind of review, we really tried to give you a framework for what it means to conceive of novelty. And we discussed three different types, empirical novelty, conceptual novelty, and methodological novelty. We wanted to finally suggest kind of codes of practice to improve what's been called rigor, kind of being thorough or careful, or validity knowing that you've answered the questions with your research design the way that you could. And then lastly, we wanted to call attention to things of style. And this is the hardest one, the most subjective one, because it relates to how do you write well? And there's also an element here of what's your own style? So when you read something, it sounds like you with your voice rather than sounding like some machine or sounding like maybe, you know, technical jargon that, that no one understands. And you can see here, at the top of this slide, we have a hyperlink to the review, which I'm only going to touch upon briefly because I don't have a lot of time today. But it is meant to be a resource for many of you to explore later. And I will admit, looking at the photographs of the authors, we are not the most diverse authoring team. John, uh, <laughs> myself, and Steve all identify ourselves as being heterosexual white men. But at least we do have diversity in hair. John has red hair, Steve has gray hair. I often say I have no hair. Uh, and on top of that, we have disciplinary diversity. So John is coming at this from transport studies and really working with modeling um, and mixed methods, longitudinal designs. I consider myself a very qualitative researcher who uses things like interviews and case studies. And Steve here is an engineer by training who does a lot of econometrics and more sophisticated data analysis. So at least what we lack in gender and class diversity, we give you a little bit more in terms of disciplinary diversity. So I've got only four suggestions for you today. And I think the first one is one that far too many academics forget. And that is at the start of your research, project, your dissertation, your thesis, your paper, whatever it might be, your grant proposal, keep reminding yourself to ask questions that both advance science, but are also socially relevant. Now, my very, very anecdotal experience as an editor would be that probably half of the research that I see is not very socially relevant. And in a world that is struggling with inequality and species loss, and climate change, and a whole host of other problems from human trafficking to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction to new disease epidemics, you know, all the way through to poverty. There are so many challenges for society uh, that academics need to address. And so this is kind of a reminder of to situate yourself into this shaded quadrant of research like Louis Pasteur who had research that both advanced the kind of understanding of pathogens and refrigeration and bacteria, but also led to very practical applications in terms of food preservation and, and food security. It, it is kind of that, that very sweet spot of research that advances science and the social good at the same time. Second suggestion goes back to what I said earlier when I alluded that we have three different types of novelty that we identify in the community of energy and climate research at least. And I think all too often, too many editors and, and reviewers are wedded to this notion of conceptual novelty. They think that to be novel, you've got to advance theory. 
And while I think that is useful, and I think you could have a very nice, satisfying career doing that, uh, there's more to life. There's more to academia than you know debating lines of theory in an armchair. I'm a huge fan of empirical research that collects data from hard to reach groups and gives them a voice, empowers them through your research, whether it is groups in your own society who may be marginalized or rarely studied, like the elderly or the disabled or children, or going to particularly vulnerable groups like the Aboriginal peoples of Australia or indigenous communities in Europe or the Native Americans in the United States, or speaking to some of the survivors that I mentioned earlier, like the survivors of Chernobyl or the survivors of Fukushima or Deepwater Horizon, or even terrorists, right? We have a study here that we published that was very novel because it actually went and, and, and worked on ISIS and tried to better understand the degree to which they were trying to access oil resources to help fund some of their networks of, of conflict. Um, all of those score very well at being empirically novel. And I think empirical novelty, because it is so grounded in earthly matters, is very important when you couple it to energy justice agendas. The third tip is a bit more difficult, and that deals more with this notion of rigor. And that is that when you do think through how you're doing your research, try to aim, maybe not for excellence, but at least aim for rigor from the start. We don't expect you as a student or an early career researcher to publish in the best journal there is, period, the first time out of the gate. And in fact, the rejection rate at most journals around the world is about 80%. So as a class, as a community, even the full professors, the vice chancellors, the provosts, the deans, and the directors and the department chairs are being rejected eight times out of 10. So we certainly don't expect students to do better than that. So it's okay if you only aim to pass, you aim to publish rather than to aim to be at the top of the field. That said, there is something for aiming for maximum validity or maximum triangulation. And in certain disciplines, you even have what have been called hierarchies of validity or ladders of evidence, which you can see here, I've given you one that comes from behavioral science. And there is kind of an intuitive notion here to these different uh, hierarchies of validity, right? Whether someone gave, told you about a personal experience they had where they smoked a cigarette and they coughed, that's maybe a small piece of evidence that smoking is bad for your health. You can move up a few levels to say two cohort studies done in North Carolina that show you that smoking is bad for your health. But a meta-analysis or a systematic review of say 150 countries and say 2 billion people over 50 years that shows you that smoking tobacco is linked to pulmonary disease, respiratory disease, et cetera, has a much stronger validity and a stronger ability to give you good evidence than any of those lower levels of the ladder. And in some disciplines now, if you were to go read some of the top medical journals, or some of the top quantitative behavioral science journals, it's all systematic reviews or meta-analyses because they realize the explanatory power that comes from moving to the top of the hierarchy of validity. And there have been others that have talked about similar things for data analysis, right? Almost no one in the professional academic community gets away with just univariate descriptive statistics anymore. Even bivariate analysis is considered moderate. Usually people like John and Steve will say, you've got to have multivariate analysis, multiple regressions, MANOVA, ANOVA, and even then maybe cross-sectional or longitudinal work that is seen as just answering questions far better than simply bivariate relationships, where it's impossible to tell if a respondent feels the way they do because they're a man, because they're high income, because of their location, et cetera. You have to control for those variables and move up to higher levels of rigor. And I've even seen some of these that I guess are also fairly intuitive for case studies, right? Well, a single case about wind energy opposition in Norway isn't quite as good as say a two case comparison, Norway and Sweden. And even then, isn't it better if you say, had a study of 55 countries around the world, wouldn't that give you more generalizability? So there are many, many people and editors who subscribe to the notion that good research is climbing the ladder. That said, in an energy justice context, that isn't always the case. For instance, if you're using mixed methods, like uh, you know interviews and a literature review, it's going to be very hard to kind of go all the way up to your different hierarchies of validity or to do a systematic review on top of your original data collection. 
These standards and norms are actually very divergent between disciplines. You could take an extremely well done meta analysis or systematic review, which took you a year. And if you send it to a discourse journal like Theory, Culture, and Society, it wouldn't even pass their desk. It would be immediately desk rejected. So there is a lot of disparity between disciplines that you have to recognize when you think about what constitutes something that's high on the hierarchy of validity. And I think even more importantly, don't choose higher forms of validity if they don't fit. The term that I use, and I like this term because it's very English, is a kind of horses for courses mentality. Have your research design fit, right? The specific nature of your research question or your project or your PhD. And don't try to aim for maximum excellence if you don't have the ability to execute it. If you don't have the time or you don't have the resources or you don't have the training or you won't have access to the data that you might need. All of those are reasons to actually stay you know, lower on the hierarchies. And something else that I should have mentioned is that you still need to do some of the lower levels of the hierarchy, i.e. people need to do the single cases and the pilot studies if others are going to build on them to then do the cohort studies or the reviews later on. No one else can review 55 cases of wind energy opposition if those cases don't exist and are published in a quote, lower form. And finally, there is sometimes a very marginal value to moving up uh, to from, you know, say uh, a 10 case comparison to a 20 case comparison, right? The, the kind of confidence you can have in the results may have already reached saturation at a much earlier point. Um, and so also realize that in some cases, you know, spending twice as long on something or twice as many resources only brings a marginal additional value to the actual manuscript or output itself. The final one, this final suggestion, apart from asking a good research question, apart from making sure that you are novel, apart from making sure that you are rigorous, is to write well. It is to have style. Uh, it is to have a kind of good macro structure to the article. And you'll notice I put these two things in frequently large font because I still maintain that the title and the abstract of your output is the most, are the two most important parts, hands down. That's what the editor sees, it's what the editorial assistant sees, it's what the peer reviewers see, and it's what the readers will see. I wouldn't say that this is 50% of the battle, but I would say that if you learn to write good titles and abstracts, you will make your life much, much easier. Most of the time, these are afterthoughts. This is the last thing an author does, and they spend 10 minutes on it. Where really, I would put this the opposite way. I would say that if you, you make the title and abstract the strongest, part. You put the most thought you can into making those two things very important. It also means thinking through a little bit more about the overall structure of the manuscript in terms of its headings and its subheadings, where you place particular paragraphs, how well you signpost between the manuscript, realizing, shock, not everyone reads a full piece of research. They skip, they skim. I will confess as a graduate student, I liked figures and tables. So I would usually read the abstract and then kind of skim for the figures and the tables and see if I could distill key insights that way. I think the number of times that I read something front to back, I could count on my hand. It was so small. Um, so it really is kind of kind of processing stuff rather than reading stuff, which means making it easy for the readers with lots of different signposts and other techniques that you can use. I often do this with a high level outline from the start, or at least I used to. Now I don't need to because I've written enough that I, I kind of I do it automatically. But at the start, when I was getting, you know, my career was beginning, every output I had had a one or two page outline that would have the title, the research question, and then all of the headings and where they would go. And then my process of writing was really populating those subheadings with thesis statements. And then at a much later stage, each thesis statement became a paragraph that was filled with evidence in some way. A big part of style is also clarity to me, and so that makes sure you know that your paragraphs have only one idea per paragraph, something that academics are horrible about. We like long paragraphs, especially particular disciplines like history or geography. Um, and I even had a, a colleague of mine who was very formulaic in his writing. Not that I would, would, uh, would urge you to do this, but for him, every paragraph was always five sentences. The first, pair, first sentence was the thesis statement and four sentences of support. And I went and I checked and I read his stuff and he was, every paragraph was actually five sentences. And he wrote dozens of articles this way. Um, there's a very good example of a very high degree of unity in paragraphs. 
I don't think you have to be that particular, but it does really get into how coherent your ideas are and appear on the page. It also means to making sure your paragraphs are roughly the same length, taking the care to write, taking care in what you write so that your subjects and objects are congruent. For example, oil prices can't boom. They can rise and fall, but they don't make noise. There's a good example of bad congruence between subject and object or writing in the active voice right, rather than the passive voice. Minimizing jargon. And then something that I'm also a huge advocate of is using visual elements, including photographs and diagrams, charts, um, and tables in, in your manuscripts to enhance what's been called visual argument um, or the rhetorical persuasiveness of what you do. Because half of what we do isn't just logic, it's rhetoric uh, and persuasion. A final part of style uh, for me is also kind of how you act as a researcher. And, and while many people I've met would probably not use the word humble when they describe me, I at least do try to be both transparent, reflective, and have a degree of humility in my research. That first of all means erring on the side of disclosing more about your research than not. So there's an element of transparency here, which can aid with replicability and replication, and also just be more honest, right, about the type of research that you did. I think a part of this too is being more proactive about you listing your own limitations, not your personal limitations. I mean, the limitations of your study or your research. I have seen so many times research sections, research method sections that mention their method and its strengths and then they stop. Well, we also want to know your limitations and weaknesses and that you can bet the peer reviewers and the critical referees and examiners will. So why not do it yourself? Why not say, and here are my limitations as I see them. You'll find it makes you both more reflective if you can address them. And it also sets you up rhetorically to be kind of to reviewer proof uh, because you yourself have acknowledged them. It means getting into the habit of asking not for praise but for criticism from your colleagues. I had a little group of, not a little group, but I had a collection of, of students that I used to kind of, we were in a reading club. And when I was going through graduate school, we would share drafts of articles. And I got some of the best comments and had some of the brightest ideas kind of develop in my head from those exchanges with our little group. And I hope the comments that I gave them uh, were also equally uh, useful. It means being respectful. This is also very difficult. I have seen lots of academic work that is that is disrespectful to those in the academy. It'll say that a study is rubbish or flawed or critically deficient or a whole variety of other terms that we can use. Um, and I found that you can kind of say just the same thing in kinder words. You can say rather than, than addressing this study's flaw, you can just say that you build on their work. Or rather than saying that this study made a mistake in not focusing on a particular topic, you could say, and I was inspired by this study to look at it a different way. So you're saying the same thing, but in a very kind of kind and respectful way. And you will appreciate that when you're on the other end of receiving criticism. And it's also important because sometimes you'll run into these people, right? And so if you're very, very hostile at someone's work and it's in writing, you may find that they're they're on a panel in a conference, or that they're even worse, maybe one of the referees for your promotion and tenure packet. Uh, and so I think that being respectful is a very important part uh, about being an academic, rather than being hostile or arrogant. And I think the final tip, and this is one that has served me well, this is a quote from a Nobel laureate who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And they said for them, what you see when you read the, his work uh, was never like that when it was initially drafted. He said for him, writing was about rewriting. Or, and I love this quote, a willingness to be terrible the first time around. And I think so many times we don't let ourselves draft and be terrible. Uh, we wait until we're feeling good. We wait until we think we're writing well. Or uh, we, we kind of we, we spend so much time on each sentence we put into a manuscript. And I, I think the opposite is actually very helpful. Get it onto the page. Worry about rewriting it later. Um, so I'm someone who certainly rewrites well. I would never say that I actually write well. So to conclude, to bring this back to you uh, and what it means for energy justice work, um, more energy justice aware research, more impactful research, I think won't happen by, hap by happenstance. It won't happen by accident. You have to plan for it. You have to design for it. You have to think through and be thoughtful how you execute research designs. I think you should start by always considering a question that matters, preferably one too that no one else has asked 
or if it's one that others have asked, it's one that you can still answer better or with new, more reliable forms of evidence. Make sure that you kind of help focus more beyond empirical novelty, moving of voices to those who have been silenced or marginalized or dispossessed or affected in negative ways by injustices or low carbon research. Your research becomes a vehicle by which these groups can actually tell their story. I think that you should always, when you can, within the resources you have, within the limitations of your training, aim for maximum validity. Go up the hierarchies, if you can, which means choosing a comparative case rather than one case, mixing methods rather than maybe choosing one method in isolation, following different codes of practice for enhancing the, the rigor uh, of your work. And then finally, don't forget that even if you've done the first three of these things, you got a banging research question, you have documented lived experiences and you have extremely rigorous research design, you can still grasp uh, defeat from the jaws of victory if you don't write well. And there are many times as an editor that I see articles that do excel in these top three things, but because they are written poorly, they're still rejected. So take the time to reflect on how well you write and present and persuade alongside the skills you're honing in terms of analysis and methodology and posing research questions. And with that, I, I'm very happy uh, to wish you the best of luck uh, in your endeavors.